Yeah. So welcome everybody. And there's a big turnout, so I'm very happy about that. So welcome to the first seminar of the assessment of China's BRI uh, program here at UVA, uh, which is sponsored by the East Asia Center, the Center of Global Innovation and Inquiry, and the college itself, plus a uh, generous donation from uh, James McConnell. Uh, two things, I just, I don't usually make a speech, but I thought there were two uh, news items in the FT which were very interesting. One was titled Fortress China, about how China is becoming extremely inward looking, how they're trying to make sure that they're not dependent on the rest of the world for everything related from uh, ranging from technology all the way through to agriculture. And the, the second one, which came the next day, was how the US is trying to make it even more difficult for Chinese firms to come in to the US and invest. So that's just the kind of profound sort of uh, challenge that is facing the world in terms of great power relationship between the US on the one hand and China on the other hand. And that is why today's uh, talk is extremely, extremely interesting because we get a view from across the pond uh, regarding China and how China is perceived in Britain. And we have someone extremely, extremely renowned to talk to us about it. So we're very lucky to be joined today by Professor John Breslin from the University of Warwick. Professor Breslin is extremely well known uh, in UK, China, you know, sort of scholarship. Uh, and he's one of those people who has a very, very nuanced view as far as the relationship between China and the rest of the world is uh, concerned. And what's more interesting for me is that he sort of looks at it from inside China outward, which I think is extremely important as we try and understand what's going on uh, across different parts of the world. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Breslin here at UBA. Thank you. thank you for those kind words and thank you for coming. I'm amazed that so many people are here on a Friday afternoon with the sun out to talk on uh, UK visions of China and it, yeah I have spent quite a lot of time trying to understand things from the inside out but of course one of the things that's happened during the pandemic is oh, it's much harder right you're left looking at the statements of political leaders uh, I, I do read the, uh, the things that are on the CNKI the China National Knowledge Infrastructure which is a good resource for Chinese academic scholarship um, but a lot of people are not publishing things because they perhaps uh, feel that they don't go with the uh, preferred visions of China's leaders and those sort of conversations that you could have over a coffee or a dinner have been lost to us over the last few years and it's been a great shame and I think it's maybe one of the reasons that tensions have developed in the way that they have things have gone a little bit more black and white because those shades of grey that we could identify in our in our friendships and discussions and seminars have been sort of denied us and uh, one of the things that has um, uh, happened is people are having to think about, well, how can I do my research on China if I can't go to China? And uh, we had a workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago organized by um, Sheffield University of Young Scholars and saying, well, what are you going to do if you can't go to China? And of course, one of the things is an emphasis on discourses, the sort of discourses that you can get hold of through official writings or through databases like the CNKI. And another thing that I think we're going to see quite a lot, though, is an increase in stuff like this. So rather than trying to understand China, which is what I've been trying to do since, well, I first went to China in 1984 as an undergraduate, which I realized last year is closer in time to the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949 than it is to today, which was a bit of a <laughs> horror show. I saw, I saw Wham! perform live in the Worker Stadium in Beijing in 1985. <laughs> Western pop band to go. Um, I've, people are turning their attention less to the sort of China side of the story and more to the, if you like, the recipient side of the story, because these are the things that you, you maybe do have some access to. And I'm not uh, a British politics specialist. I have just finished a paper on the tilt to the Indo-Pacific and handily did it with a British politics expert. So that helped uh, quite a lot. But one of the things that the British government does uh, does do is engage with academics on a fairly regular basis. So on the far extremes of policy making, I've been able to see a little bit of the workings and the mechanics and the thinking. Um, and this is what I'm going to really talk about today and how the Belt and Road fits into uh, a changing 
framing of the understanding of the consequences of China's rise in the UK, uh, and one that has changed incredibly quickly. Now, the sort of transitions I'm talking about here today can probably, you can probably look at Germany and the Netherlands and other countries in Europe and Sweden and say that there have been similar sort of processes. But I think the speed of the transition in the UK has perhaps been the uh, one of the fastest and the most uh, significant in some ways. So this was 2015. <clears throat> That's David Cameron in, uh, he wasn't to know this yet, the final year of his premiership, the final year because he decided to have a referendum on Brexit, which he then lost. So well done. Uh, and I recognize the, uh, the gentleman on the other side there with the pint of beer. This was the golden age of UK-China relations. This was a period when the UK was competing with other European countries to try and become China's best friend in Europe. There was a feeling that the UK had fallen behind, particularly to Germany, uh, that Chancellor Merkel had done a very good job of promoting Germany-China relations. Um, Cameron had previously met with the Dalai Lama. There was a feeling that the UK was losing out uh, and that the UK had to try better than ever to become China's best friend. Remin Bean's nationalisation was something that uh, the City of London felt that it might have a particular stake in. Um, increased in the investment into the UK was seen as being very important because this was a period when the Conservative government was still pushing a policy of austerity after the financial crisis of 2008. They had some big projects in mind, particularly in the north of England, and this is actually in Manchester. Uh, and there was a big push to get Chinese investment in because if you're having a policy of austerity, but you also want to spend on infrastructure, well, somebody else is going to have to do the spending. Mm -hmm. So into 2016, this was still the mantra, um, but by 2019, really, things had changed quite considerably. Now, uh, oh, you can't quite see that, can you, because it's, these are some of the things that have come out, been published or organised in recent years that really chart the very dramatic change of um, UK policy towards China. Global Britain, the competitive age, was uh, the integrated review of, of defence and foreign policy that came out under the Boris Johnson leadership that said that China was a, a systemic challenger to the United Kingdom, but also a country that China, uh, that the UK wanted to work with in terms of economics, right? It's been called a cakeist foreign policy of having your cake and eating it at the same time. Let's say how much we dislike China, but welcome its investment, but actually not there if you don't mind. Uh, please just invest in the, in the right places. Various parliamentary reports, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, Defence Committee, you can find these if you're particularly interested. You can even find the Lord's International Relations and Defence Committee video, and I'm on it. And the secret that I'll tell you is that I was wearing my shorts because it was very hot and it was done by Zoom. So I only had the top, the top part of me on that. So a whole, a whole range of different reports. Um, I think perhaps in some respects, most significantly, the China Research Group was established in the Conservative Party in 2020 a group of backbench conservative MPs who have been very China skeptic and very vocal in pushing a very um, negative sort of a position on China or, or a negative position on UK-China relations. Um, uh, the reason that I've put here at the bottom the China working group within the Labour foreign policy group is because as with the US, there's an increase in bipartisanship overviews of, uh, of China and the UK. So in the space of three years, a much more critical sort of position was coming out. Now, in the past, of course, there had also been critical positions on China. A lot of people were unhappy about human rights and that the UK policy was not doing anything about human rights. But business groups had said that China hadn't opened in the way that uh, it should have done with the sort of engagement that had taken place. But the crucial difference, I think, is the well, two crucial differences. First of all, the extent and the range of issues. And secondly, China is now seen as a security threat. And that is a fundamental difference from things that have been said about China before. So this was the, uh, the head of MI6, the, um, the, the equivalent, really, I suppose, of the CIA, uh, saying that China is now the UK's 
biggest priority, that it is a threat to UK national security. And the uh, MI5 and FBI, so you can see that MI5 is the equivalent of FBI, also have said the same. A joint statement saying that China is now a threat to national security. So in the past, when there were criticisms of uh, UK China policy, it might have been pragmatic. It might have been because um, it wasn't leading to the expected change within China. But you've seen this really significant challenge now and change to China becoming a threat. Uh, Liz Truss, who is our new prime minister, uh, is very likely to officially declare China a threat. Um, but in some respects, it didn't matter that it was her that won the uh, leadership election and is now a new prime minister, because effectively all of the candidates had to show their China skeptic credentials. It was almost a prerequisite. I've never heard China mentioned before in previous leadership races and elections. It's just not been on the table. But there was some sort of expectation this time round that, that this should be the case, that you really had to sort of say, yes, I'm going to take a hard position on China, or you weren't going to get elected. So in keeping, I think, with the story that you often hear in other parts of the world, one of the starting points behind this is that didn't work. The policy of liberal engagement that had been pushed, at least rhetorically, by uh, leaders uh, in a number of countries, including the UK, that China would become more like, I'll use inverted commas, us, domestically and internationally, simply hadn't worked. And whilst uh, I'm going to talk about the Belt and Road uh, and the impact that it had specifically on Chinese foreign policy, I'm not going to claim that it's the single only reason that there has been a shift in policy. It's not. And this is one of them. There was this increased frustration, I think, by about well, 2018, this came out, that the change that people have been talking about in China for so many years hadn't happened. The period that we're talking about, of course, also coincides or not coincides, it's not coincidental, with an increasing focus on what's happened in Xinjiang in the UK. It became quite big news for many years. Human rights in China had really gone off the agenda. People were talking about discussing it. But newspapers like The Guardian and the BBC uh, took a particularly proactive role in really um, uh, highlighting what was going on in Xinjiang. And that clearly had an impact. I would say amongst my students, it's probably the, uh, the thing that has really made them many of them interested in China. And of course, um, what's happened in, U in Hong Kong has very specific resonance for the UK because there are international treaties involved and also passport and citizenship arrangements. So changing China has also had an impact. So it's not just that China hasn't become more like the West in the sort of popular discourse, it's got worse, as it were. Things have got worse within China. So that's another reason. Um, the, the sort of contagion or influence of debates over China in other countries, not least here, not least in the States. I mean, there was direct pressure placed on the UK government about um, policy towards Huawei. But, but certainly what's happened in Australia, China relations has had an impact too on the way in which the wisdom of becoming too closely interlinked with the Chinese economy has been discussed and debated. Supply chain vulnerabilities. There's more talk these days about um, the problems of, you know, what if in the future something happens to disrupt these supply chains, as has happened with COVID, and indeed when that ship managed to park itself right across the Suez Canal, which actually had quite a big impact on the import of certain commodities into the UK from one. All these things will come back on to shortly. The pandemic, yeah, it doesn't help, right? I mean, it certainly didn't help. Certainly the way in which a rather defensive, aggressive position was taken by some Chinese foreign affairs uh, figures went down quite badly in the UK, including the uh, then ambassador from China to the UK, and the war with, in Ukraine has, has clearly had an impact too. Um, perhaps this, more than anything else, this is actually Chinese direct investment into the EU as a whole, and what you see is insignificant, insignificant, insignificant global crisis, bang, right? A very steep 
upward curve. Now we need to be a little bit careful about these figures, as I will explain in a second. Um, but when you have a jump like this, it's going to make people take notice, right? So you have a changing material relationship with China, from China being primarily seen as being a producer or a market or a global workplace, to China as a source of finance for other countries in the sort of 2000s, Chinese investment in Africa, Latin America, to this rather rapid rise. And if you can't see it, this is mainly acquisitions. So this is mergers and acquisitions. And of the countries that China looked to in Europe, the UK was one of the most significant. So from not really being worried at all about Chinese investment in about 2012, 2013, it rather quickly comes onto the agenda. Having said that, we need to be a bit careful. If you show a figure like this, you see a huge rise, but actually it doesn't tell you much on its own. How much is that compared to investment from India, from Japan, from the United States, from Ireland? And the answer is actually not very much. And the reason it stops at 2016 is it starts going down after that. This is Tom Tugendhat, one of the most vocal voices of criticism over the UK's China policy, stood for leadership, didn't win, in uh, something on the China Research Group's webpage. You can go away and have a look at it. And that's uh, Sherrod Cooper Coles, who's chair of the China Britain Business Council. And you can, you can go through this debate. But the, uh, what it adds up to is while all this looks quick, if you compare it, it's not. The total stock of Chinese investment in the UK, last figures, 0.2% of the total foreign investment stock in the UK. Right. Investment is dwarfed, as you can see there. I keep saying, you know, I use an island, it's because I'm Irish, but investment from Ireland dwarfs the amount of investment into China. So why does it become so political and why does it come so contentious? Well, partly because it's grown quickly, but partly because of expectations about the future. And this is where the Belt and Road comes in. Because I think the Belt and Road was very significant in creating an understanding of what it was that China wanted. And these are horrible terms, what does China want? Because if you, you, know, if you want to go and ask every 1.4 billion Chinese, you might get more than one answer, but that's the sort of language of the debate. So I think this is this is really interesting. So this was in The Guardian in 2015. I'll explain who these people are. Jim O'Neill, you might know, he was the banker who came up with the BRICS acronym. He invented the acronym BRICS. He became a member of the House of Lords, an advisor on UK policy, and became Commerce Secretary in the government. George Osborne, actually. George Osborne. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, so effectively the, the, the Treasury Secretary, I think, in the American system. And this guy basically ran UK-China policy under David Cameron. So that tells you something in itself, that it's the Treasury that is running China policy rather than the Foreign Office. And actually, the quote is probably less important than the title. It's in Britain's interest to bond with China now. The future prosperity of this country depends on us strengthening our relationship with the world's next superpower. Now, if you ever write our academic articles, don't have a title as long as this, right? But, but at least it, it, it sums it up. It tells you everything that you need to know. And why has he, th he thought this? Because of the Belt and Road, right? He's listened to the message of the Belt and Road. <clears throat> he's accepted it, he's taken it as a signal of a China that is prepared to, to do things in certain ways in the future. Here is a China that has the financial resources. Britain's a not particularly powerful country. Are we able really to sort of uh, change China? Probably not. So we may as well get on with it and try and build as good a relationship with China as we possibly can. Uh, but there we are, actually, one of the trips that he went to China, he did go to Xinjiang uh, and refused to take um, answers, uh, questions from journalists. And actually, his policy was very unpopular, even within his own party. There are lots of people within the party that thought he'd just gone far too far. But he listened to the Belt and Road. So basically, I think we can say that the Belt and Road has been crucial in establishing a new sort of focus on, on economic statecraft 
And it's not perhaps the Belton Road itself as much as the way that the Belton Road has been projected and promoted in certain ways. There was a, well, anyway, was the, I think he had a book out on the Belton Road almost before uh, the, the, the phrase had become commonly known. Um, there were groups of think tanks uh, going around Europe, extolling the virtues of the Belton Road, explaining how this was China's new great vision. I wonder, perhaps more so in Europe than here, because perhaps here there was always a feeling that Americans were never going to buy it, right? <laughs> but there was a possibility that Europeans might find some way of buying into this new thing. Uh, but it was a very, a very, very forceful, proactive promotion of the Belt and Road. This was strategic signaling by not just the Chinese state, but think tanks and academics to promote this idea. And, and people like George Osborne heard it, listened to it, and said, let's get on with it. The problem was that a number of other people saw it, listened to it, and instead of saying, oh, good, said, oh, God. So uh, I, I, uh, Freeman is actually a PhD student, I think, still at Oxford, uh, but writes a lot in um, various um, small provincial universities, but writes a lot in the think tanks and the journals and things like that. Refer to it on the China Research Group okay. page. Remember the group that's set up in the Conservative Party as a political campaign to build a regional and global order with Chinese characteristics. So what I think the Bolton Road did was serve as a framing mechanism through which people then perceived China's future intent and created a framework through which they, they looked at other things that China was doing, including things like the investment that I was talking about before. And if I say China and I'm aggregating 1.4 billion people again into one thing, that's because this is the way the discourse evolves that the discourse evolves into a certain understanding uh, that is based around an, a, a concept of economic statecraft and based on state intent and party intent as being assumed to be behind pretty much everything that is done by every Chinese international actor overseas. So let's take a couple of steps backwards now that we've seen the uh, hopefully we've seen what is this rather dramatic shift in UK relations or perceptions of China and why I think it came around. Now one of the things that I'm very interested in is how different ways of studying China can generate very different research questions, very different conclusions, but also very different conceptions of what is evidence and how you use it. Now, this is a very, a very bad table, right? So I was in Shanghai and I went to give a talk at the uh, Shanghai uh, Institute of, oh, I can't remember, International Studies, I think it was. Well, uh, anyway, it was some sort of institute in Shanghai near the football stadium. And they asked me to sort of talk about how different ways in which China was studied in the UK. And I, I came up with these five and I'm not saying they're fixed, I think they blur into each other. Uh, but over here, you've got area studies. Perhaps you've, in these three here, you've got much more of a focus on trying to disaggregate different actors, different interests, different drivers, really doing the deep dive into the domestic sort of thing that I've tried to do in my career to come up with a variegated understanding of what different Chinese actors want in different settings. And over here, you've got perspectives that really tend to discount the domestic or not worry too much about the domestic, or in some cases, be more concerned about uh, what happened in Sparta as a guide to what's going to happen in the future than what happened in Beijing or Shanghai. And I think one of the things that has uh, sort of happened is that as China has become bigger, <laughs> more important, more powerful is that we've seen a movement. This is very blunt divisions, right? So don't take it very seriously. Take it as a sort of a basic guide. We've seen a movement this way. And a lot of the things that are being said about China are now sort of more influenced by things that are over this side of the uh, this bad table. 
than over the other side. And the starting assumption, I think, establishes not just what is evidence, but what it is evidence of too. So if you think about debt trap diplomacy, right? If I was looking or thinking of doing work on uh, a debt a specific debt relationship that China has with another country, I'd be I'd be over here somewhere, right? Trying to think, well, you know, where's the company from? Is it state owned enterprise? Is it a local enterprise? Is it a private enterprise? What was it trying to get? How did it interact with the sort of stuff you do with the domestic actors and things like this? But when you think about the debt trap diplomacy, it's sort of over here. The, the assumption in the first place is that there is intent to generate debt. So rather than asking, you know, what, what, what's the result? How does this get here? The assumption is that that was the intention in the first place. The debt is the evidence of the intent. And I think that is rather problematic. But that sort of way of thinking and looking does seem to have become increasingly prevalent in shaping the way that a lot of people think and talk about China, not least within um, policy fields. So investment, not just on the Belt and Road, is seen as evidence in itself of strategic intent and the consequences of economic statecraft that is either there to uh, attain state goals or party goals, or more often this sort of conflation of party state. So the very fact that it exists is evidence itself of this strategy, right? of this intent behind the strategy. Now, actually, I think once you begin digging into this, it makes no sense, because most of these, uh, a, a lot of the debt problems that have emerged, you know, for, 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 it doesn't lead to the port being given to the Chinese as happened in Sri Lanka. A lot of the time, it leads to people saying, well, why did you waste the money on this stupid project? You know, if there really was a debt trap, you'd be wanting to invest in more projects that were destined to fail rather than less, right? <laughs> but this discourse of debt trap is being repeated. And it feeds into, I think, this specific understanding of a form of economic statecraft and geoeconomics that is uh, shaping what China is doing. So, Economic statecraft and geoeconomics in three and a half minutes. I apologize for <laughs> doing this extremely quickly. Some of you, though, will, will be very well aware of it. So I've sort of tried to divide it into sort of three generations. David Baldwin's book in the 80s really led to a sort of upsurge in interest in economic statecraft. And he was looking historically to see how various things that states had done had led to um, consequences. And his argument was that actually they'd been more successful than the overall general literature on international relations would, would have us believe. Uh, and he focused particularly on sanctions, but also aid and things like that. Then after the fall of the Cold War, fall of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, um, there's a new generation. As sort of old security concerns disappear, there's a new generation of economic statecraft literature, where really I think they're actually talking about economic security much more than, than than economic statecraft but there's another uh upsurge in literature talking about how you how you marry globalization and security but i think we're now on to a third generation which is i say primarily but i think overwhelmingly dominated by trying to understand uh, chinese overseas economic activity and explain it in certain ways and it's very closely related to understanding of geoeconomics. And the key thing I've put there in bold is to advance geopolitical objectives. So it's an attempt to try and find the ways in which the Chinese state use economic means to advance its geopolitical objectives, not supposedly just to make money, not supposed you know, just to help firms out but expand its geopolitical objectives. So what can it do? Or how is the Belt and Road explained as doing this? Well, the Belt and Road itself is seen as an exercise in, in geoeconomics. Uh, it, it is in itself, the very advancement of it is the process. Trade deals, the RCEP, for example, 
that's often thought of as being a, a project in economic statecraft, aid projects, sanctions like the ones in Australia, trade war with the United States. Unofficial sanctions are quite interesting. When uh, South Korea uh, uh, did the, um, got involved with the THAAD, uh, the amount of uh, Chinese tourists to South Korea just disappeared almost yeah. overnight. There was no actual sanction, but it had an impact on the South Korean economy. But what I'm really interested in here is the spillover from the Belt and Road influence perspectives into statecraft that is behind more commercial types of activity. Now, in 2021, most investment from China into the European Union was by non-central state-owned enterprises, the sort of non-state sector. It gets a bit blurry often with local enterprises are they really part of the local state or not but we can certainly say that a large amount of the money that goes into Europe and the UK comes from either local governments that you would think perhaps have very different objectives from central government uh, and often from the private sector. Huawei is an employee-owned company. The company that bought the uh, German uh, robotics company KUKA that caused such a huge hoo-ha in Germany at the time private company. So are the international activities of non-state actors undertaken for commercial reasons evidence of economic statecraft to attain geostrategic objectives? You would think the answer should be no, right? This is about commerce. If a Canadian firm tries to get involved in a UK sector, is that economic statecraft? Well, no, it's not. That's a commercial. If an American firm does, no. If a Finnish firm does, no. If it's a Chinese firm, yes. <laughs> Increasingly, that is seen as being evidence of economic statecraft. So it seems to me that the very concept of what is economic statecraft is being stretched when it comes to China uh, and is rather different from the way it is used, this concept is used when it's uh, the same investment comes from other countries. So of course then the answer is, is why? Um, well there is actually in the literature some idea of uh, the desire to gain a commercial or te technological advantage over rivals, right? Some people say, yeah, but they're not really private, are they? Look at the amount of support they get from the Chinese state. Right? They wouldn't be investing overseas if they were really sort of private actors. You know, they're, 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 they might be private, but they're too connected. Right? Local governments are often there. Party committees, this is one thing you hear quite a lot. They're private, but they've got party committees on them. So ultimately, the party committee can force them to do what they want to do. And the party might not be on a day-to-day -day level controlling them, but in the future, they might be able to if they want to. The party might not be controlling Huawei now, but what about in the future when it decides to? But here is the two things that I, I think I want to focus on. There is this even greater amorphous, undefined, I think, idea that if a Chinese company gets bigger, stronger, more competitive, wealthier as a result of these activities. Add this all together, and it results in China becoming bigger, stronger, wealthier, more competitive in the future. And then you have this even less specific idea that a bigger, stronger, more competitive, richer China in the future cannot be a good thing. That's why it becomes seen as being economic statecraft. So it's the consequence that almost ends up defining it as economic statecraft rather than the actual action and intent. And to come back to what I was saying before, I think a lot of this is due to the way that the Belt and Road was seen as an exercise in strategic signaling. So I'll try and leave uh, some time and go through this last bit relatively quickly. So here we have the in the parliamentary, the latest parliamentary inquiry into UK-China relations, these people get evidence at the same session. This is Yu Jie, Cherry Yu, who I taught as an undergraduate 
the first actually PRC student to do an undergraduate degree in politics and international studies at Warwick. She is a researcher at Tatton House. This is Charlie Parton. Charlie is a retired uh, diplomat who has become, what is, what is the phrase we're using, Brantley? He's become very proactive in pushing his views on China. So Yujie says everything that instinctively as an academic who has spent years trying to understand China from the inside out would say, you know, when we're talking about economic security, we have to differentiate between whether those investments are truly for state purposes as an expression of state capital or individual economic behavior. I think we have to distinguish that before we can draw a conclusion to argue whether Chinese investment should be seen as a threat to UK national security. Charlie says, I'm not particularly bothered by the ownership of countries, it's irrelevant. There was the whole Huawei debate about the private company, a state owned company, who cares? It really is unimportant because everybody knows that if the Communist Party says to a company, jump, the only answer is certainly, sir, how high? And this view is the one that tends to be primarily influencing the way that Chinese investment by non state actors, I think, is perceived and understood within the UK. So this leaves us unable to see <laughs> the, the, the top of this slide. I think in a situation where the idea of China as a security threat to the UK has become a bit confused and, and it's, it's, it's not guns, bombs and bullets. As, as horrible and destructive as guns, bombs and bullets are, they're quite easy to identify. What is it about China that is a threat? Well, thing A, you can't see there is things we don't like. Xinjiang, Hong Kong, political repression, lack of liberalization. And I think that's very important. But is it a, a security threat? Number two is immediate challenges, immediate threats. And then it's actually quite difficult to think what, what these are. Uh, there have been times when China's restricted some exports of rare earths, for example. Um, sanctions. You might have heard today that the Chinese delegation has not been allowed in to see the Queen because um, a number of UK MPs are still officially sanctioned by the, uh, by the Chinese state. And so they've complained about this and so they've not let the Chinese delegation. UK is not in a trade war with, uh, with China, but Australia is, that sort of thing. That's an immediate threat. The things that um, are seen as being the threat by MI5 and MI6 are influence operations designed to sort of uh, shape discourses and policy debates. So wouldn't it be interesting if I was an agent of Chinese influence that was using this to talk about Chinese <laughs> cyber uh, and technology stealth. Technology stealth is seen. So these are the immediate things, right? But then we get this bigger group, things that might become a threat in the future. And this is, I think, what most of the discourse is about. The what if questions. What if, what, what, what Charlie's saying really, what if the party at some point decides to do this? What if in the future Huawei does do this? Uh, what if the nuclear power plant has some sort of technology built into it? So all these what if questions are the things that people are focusing on, I think, most closely. Then we've got world order type challenges, which I would divide into two. One would be, if you like, a normative challenge, like the way in which um, the concept of human rights is being challenged at the United Nations. I think uh, in some cases quite effectively um, by, uh, by Chinese representatives. And the other are what you might call political economy world order type consequences, changing flows of uh, goods and money across the world. Uh, for example, through Chinese investment in and along the Belt and Road in Africa and places like that. And then you have this unspecific assumption that a rich and strong China cannot be a good thing for the liberal order. So I think we've got these are where the China threat actually emerges from. And in my view, A and E, so things we don't like, and the unspecific assumption shapes what is perceived as what might be a threat and also some of the world order type threats and i'm not saying this is necessarily right or wrong 
But depending on what you think the most important thread is, you have to have very different responses. So if, if you're going to focus on B and C, that might push you down a route of economic nationalism and protectionism in response to this China threat. But if it's D and you're looking at the political economy consequences, that actually might suggest a route of more internationalization and internationalism and globalism rather than economic nations. So um, I think it's, you know, it, it's unclear. It's this idea that there's something out there that needs to be resisted. I think the Belt and Road played an important role in, in shaping those framing mechanisms, uh, although perhaps not as important as um, the other things put together that I've been speaking about. One final question is, how much does the policy shift discourse really matter? In the period that the um, China has been increasingly spoken about as a security threat, people are talking about disengagement, UK investment in China has increased. The business community don't seem to have seen the same sort of threat that the political uh, commentators seem to have or the British government has not put in place the sort of policies to act as incentives and penalties to obstruct what is still seen as the economic logic of engaging in China in a certain way. Ready for this? This is an amazing graph. This is the shift in the UK's trade relationship with major countries after Brexit. Being trade dependent on China is a bad thing. So the discourse goes, and what happens? You can see the number. Now, this is partly because of the pandemic and the sort of things that are being imported, uh, and partly because of the recovery. But look at this. Netherlands is a very specific case because of the Rotterdam effect. If anybody's really interested in the Rotterdam effect, I will explain that later, but don't worry about it too much for the, for the time being. But in the context of Brexit, in the context of exact moment when the discourse of China becomes more China skeptic, in some cases more China hostile, China seen as a threat, the economic relationship actually becomes deeper and more embedded. I don't know where that actually leaves us, um, but that's the situation that we're in at the moment. I think Liz Truss as incoming Prime Minister obviously has a lot of things on her agenda. Uh, the incredible price of energy in the UK. It's astonishing. You think gas is expensive here? Drive a car in, in the UK. In fact, why aren't you all in the UK? The exchange rate has collapsed. You, you, you could buy most of the country if you hopped on a plane over there now and come back again. It's effectively one to one. 2004, I got $2 to the pound. I just got $1.1.06. $1 .1 Damn it. But somewhere on that list, is China for trust. I think we're going to have a, a thorough investigation, not just into economic links, but also perhaps into educational links. If you're worried about trade dependency on China, whether it's a good idea to officially call China a threat to national interests, at that level of trade seems to be increasing, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you to decide. It's hot. Friday afternoon. This picture was actually taken on National Day 2018, uh, the West Lake in Hangzhou. If it looks empty, it's because 8 million people standing behind me watching me take that photograph at the time. But that's my uh, political philosophy to you to say thanks for listening, if indeed you have been. <laughs>
what do we do? <laughs> you know, how, can, how can we constrain it? But this is sort of partly comes back to a sort of conversation we were we were having outside. I think within China, so in in comedy, there's a discussion about the difference between punching up and punching down, right? Uh, so if you make a joke about somebody who's more powerful than you or a greater hierarchy than you, it can be funny. But if you say the same things about people that are below you, it sounds vicious. And I think there is still in some parts of China, this idea that they're punching up. We, we see a punching down, certainly in Europe, perhaps not here, <laughs> perhaps you, but we see the China that's punching, uh, punching down and they still think there is a punching up. So I think there is this, um, this idea that the Westies or the UK and Europe could stop China getting the sort of things that it wants. And one of the interesting things about this level of investment, which is often seen as being this great success, is a lot of it is happening to get the sort of innovation that has been unable to be generated uh, domestically as well. So, uh, yeah, you do I, you do get that because I'm often surprised by the extent to which the, um, the idea that the UK could actually can contain China and prevent its sort of rise. But but it is there. Yeah, there is the, the discourse and the discussion of the. Um, uh, of stopping China from catching up and, and attaining its rightful, rightful place, and um, you get it more with the when you're having discussions with people talking about big picture strategy than with the people who are European specialists who tend to see things in a rather different way. But I, you know, in, if I sort of use the the flip side of my table on China watching, if I can go back to it, if I can find it, the thing. I think often uh, what's happened in recent years in, in China is it's the sort of people over here who are not necessarily the, the areas. So you, so you do get it. Um, and in some respects, I get it, right? In some respects, I get it. I remember being at the Foreign Affairs University as a visiting scholar a few years ago, and they were saying, but what are we, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're investing. We're providing, we're providing infrastructure. Why are you so, why are you so worried about it? We're only doing, we're, we're playing catch up. We're behind, which is this punching up and punching down sort of perception. And I think that mismatch between people who see someone punching down and the people that are punching down thinking they're punching up is one of the reasons that there's been this, one of the reasons that there has been this sort of tension. But yeah, I think there is, there, there is some. You might, you know, people might dismiss it, but it, I think it's real amongst the people who are holding it. Um, so I had a question about um, what I take away from some of the geoeconomic strategy um, literature. I, I think the one of the most successful geoeconomic strategies was the United States after World War II. It throws open its market, uh, provides aid to Europe and Japan and many other places. And by doing nice things economically for lots of countries makes them increasingly dependent on our market and draws them into our orbit. Okay. Um, and when the BRI was first announced, I thought this, this might be what they're doing too. Some of these, you know, plans sound like they're going to develop some of these countries. Um, is, and yet all the examples you gave of what Britain is concerned about is about uh, China being taking advantage. Right of Europe in its economic transactions, if you're being taken advantage of, there's no leverage for China because Europe could just give up on, give up those arrangements if, if they're so unattractive. So just a, a thought on whether people in Britain think at all about, I mean, the fact that now they're, they're getting a lot of trade with China, especially if that's British exports to China. No, it's, it's overwhelmingly important. But there are exports too, right? Yeah. But I'm um, curious whether you get no, it, 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 the difference between those two. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting thing. If you go and read um, Xi Jinping's speech at Davos a few years back, he basically says, we welcome everybody to get aboard the express train of Chinese development. So it's that sort of story. Come on board and come and join us. And remember, in lots of respects, the Belt and Road and the sort of narrative uh, isn't, isn't designed for, for, for Britain. But we, we, West European countries didn't didn't sign up to it, right? So, in terms of the way the message has been promoted and received in other parts of the world, then that's and perhaps the problem with the Belt and Road is it's just so damn big, and it's got, it has to cover everything. 
then it does leave all this uh, leeway for it to be interpreted in the positive benign way that you're talking about in some parts of the world uh, but then in, in this perhaps sort of more negative and, and hostile way in other parts of of the world and um i've lost the track of where i was going in response to your question there what was the specific question <laughs> i guess whether some people in britain when they look at the chinese economic challenge see it more as china's being too kind to us they're um, drawing us in by having such an attractive economic arrangements that our companies profit our people do well and we're going to be unable to leave that behind no i don't think that i think it's the trade that is more the, the problem in terms of that rather than the investment side of things but it's predicated on this assumption that something nefarious will happen in the in the future so it's the sort of um, the smiling face, but the sort of I think you know some people have said, do you think there's a degree of racism in, in all of this? You know, the sort of uh, the Eastern sort of, and um, actually, I do think I, I sort of half jokingly once referred to China as the orange peril, in that it represents a combination of the perception of the yellow peril of the exotic, different Orient mm -hmm. from the nineteenth century and then the red peril of communism from the 20th century and if you add that together it comes out as his origin i said it off as a joke and i still mean it sort of half as a joke but i do think there's something in that as well that is this idea of sort of this this different asianism and this different and it's still a communist party state therefore for both of these reasons we can't trust it so i do think perhaps there's a little bit of uh, that in but i've never heard anybody say explain it exactly in the way that you've explained it but there is just, I think, this general feeling that being so dependent cannot be a good thing in the future, but not necessarily because of China welcoming it and it does it with open arms, because most of the discourse is about how damn hard it is to still actually to do to do things in China. Um, hmm, oh, that's a half answer. I'm going to mull on that. I might come back to you over the email. Yeah, so uh, as we kind of saw the previous G7 conference in the UK, the, you know, Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, who kind of came, and they, one of the questions they were asking is what was the direct response to the Belt Belt Road? And they kind of came up with their build back better world, lack specific, specificity. Yeah. Uh, but um, my question is, how do you think um, that kind of framework uh, where do you think that lines up with your like A to E? Is it more influenced by the A to E or the C through the the C through? Um... The build back better is is D, right? It's a response to the world order type challenges. But I I think the rhetoric at G seven is different from the daily discourse of of actual politics, where the emphasis is very much on A, B, and C rather than on D. So the the UK's put. Uh, it, it's that is called what it, a tilt to the Indo-Pacific, right? So it's not a pivot, it's a tilt. <laughs> but this doesn't entail anything like the sort of commitments that the European Union is talking about through their gateway or the build back better. It's more a sort of diplomatic shift and tilt. So in terms of the concrete things that are being done in terms of uh, a British build back better, oh my God, I'm say build, build back, you know what? I mean. <laughs> um it's it's it, it, insignificant is that too strong it, it's not very significant compared to the the daily focus that has been placed on a b and c and my gut instinct is that we will see less even of that internationalism under the new prime minister than we've seen before so i think we might see the existing development spending commitments cut actually um in the next two years up to the next election i wouldn't be at all the boat surprised i, I noticed that there's a, a question in the chat oh start i don't know but, oh okay yeah so Brett, i think professor will might go ahead and then yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, great talk and that's so many different ways to go but like just um say one short thing about uh, the party committees and you know whether the Chinese government can order the companies and their involvement it should be remembered 
that the United States and UK, in fact, any government has considerable power over its domestic and overseas uh, economic enterprises. When the United States adopts sanctions against Russia or against Iran, uh, it, the company, it says, jump back. And most of the companies say, how far? You know, it's not a question of, of party committees. It's no. a question of national policy. I think he was explicitly trying to get over the things that she was saying here, though, about making a, because if you frame everything yeah, yeah. as being the Communist Party, right. even more so than the Chinese state, right. then it generates a certain type of reaction. Right, right, because it focuses on a mechanism rather than the actual ability. Oh, on a mechanism, but it also, you know, Communist Party. The, the, right, right, right. And those two orange, orange. Even if it was the South Korean state or the Japanese or, or whatever, but the Communist Party. I mean, it, it's very clear uh, the language that's used. Yeah. On a more basic point, it seems like that the ultimate problem is that China's rise changes the proportion of the world, and BRI has helped uh highlight that proportional change and the prospects of continuing proportional change and this is i think especially an acute worry for the united states as the the previous hegemon you know what does it do to our power but then when you consider the last 500 years and the emergence of, of western modernization and that europe has developed countries and europe and its history uh, including Britain, despite Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, they, we are losing, we, we may not be the targets, but we are losing privilege. We are losing status. We're entering a world that it, it, we are less on top uh, than we were. Mm -hmm. uh, and what are the consequences going to be? Uh, and, uh, uh, even though Britain, Germany, Japan weren't in control of the unipolar world order, they were beneficiaries of the order that, that, that they were a, a, you know, top floor of that structure rather than bottom floors. Oh, abso absolutely. I mean, you go into the, sorry, go into the global financial crisis, or of course the international financial crisis, it's my Chinese colleagues insist on calling it because it wasn't global, it was a certain time. And there is still, I think, so what happens is there is a perceptions of power asymmetries flip in Europe, uh, between Europe and China at, at that point. And it's part in it, and that's not because of China's making in many respects. It's our fault, right? It's the crisis of, of, of the neoliberal project that creates that sort of shock and the perception. I, I think the, you can. The moment that the perception of that asymmetry is flipped is when they get off the plane in Beijing asking for uh, help for the bailout of the euro. So it flips, right? It flips very clearly there. And there's a crisis of confidence, a very strong crisis of confidence in the dominance of, of the liberal global order. And actually, just liberal preferences full stop, <laughs> let alone the liberal, uh, the liberal global order. And it, it is different. When you're not the global, I mean, if you're the number one, if you're the United States, look at the number two. That's different. You know, the European countries and Europe as a whole is trying to work out how it can deal with these externalities that it really doesn't have the ability to control or even influence in the way that the United States does. I mean, the United States might not be able to change China, but it has significant influence over the uh, whole range of things in ways that that Europe simply just doesn't quite. So there is, I think underpinning a lot of this not just the looming specter of the world that you change but where does this leave us where does this leave you know the liberal order and liberalism and all these things that we thought or the of, western order what's that all the west the liberality of it yeah be questioned in some respect okay yeah all the, all the western or the or where, you know where is the place for europe as this this order sort of shapes out and and Britain finds itself in a particularly tricky place because it, you know, can't quite decide really whether it's just going to go along with an Anglo sphere. You look at AUKUS, uh, you know, Britain, the U Britain, USA, and Australia 
I think there's an instinct for an Anglosphere sort of approach, mm -hmm. but actually in so many things it makes sense to have a European, sort of European approach, but that ain't going to happen for the moment. So Britain is doubly caught, I think, between you know global Britain as an independent power that is back east of Suez as a global power on its own, yeah. part of an Anglosphere with Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US, and then probably in third place, but some still sort of instinctive reality that actually we are European, irrespective of what people say. And many of our uh, things in the future are gonna depend on what happens in the rest of Europe. So I think, yeah, so that's a complex way of agreeing, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, really struck by the sort of the dual track system, let's borrow this phrase, between the discourse and action, which it seemed to be playing out in the American case as well. We right. see sort of the trade war going on, but actually Chinese ex export to the US increased by 20 or 30%. Yeah. In the US. American investment increased into China too. Oh, it is? We did last like year. I was about to say that there's a kind of vulnerable linkage in American case of the interest of American companies. It seems they are more willing to get on board with um, government gender because the Chinese domestic market, it seems, was willing to be closed out to outside investors. And there's zero COVID policies. So I was wondering if there's uh, similarly kind of vulnerable linkages in the British case as far as the interest of British companies is concerned. So I was, uh, I better not say who, so I was talking to somebody recently who used to be involved in commerce for the British Embassy in Beijing. And I said to them, do you think that any of these sort of things are really influencing the, um, in a Xinjiang, Hong Kong, all these things are influencing the, the decisions that are companies are making in terms of investing in China. And he said, no, not, not bothered at all, really. Um, what is concerning is the Made in China 2025. They're probably focusing more on that, even though we've had quite a few years of that now, on the fact that the, the expectations of openness don't seem to have come to fruition. But here's the interesting thing, that for years and years, while you might have worried about Chinese politics, if you were investing, now you've got to worry about American policy. Yeah. Right? So you've got to think, if I produce this in China, not to access the Chinese market, but to produce exports, which is still the priority, I think, of UK investment in China is to produce goods to export to other places. Am I going to be able to export? <laughs> so it's not necessarily what the Chinese do, it's, it's what, what the Americans do, right? Or what the European Union do. And it's just added that layer of complexity. But the thing is, at the moment, the potential obstacles or incentives to go other places aren't there in significant numbers to make it commercially viable yet. I think you know it's beginning to happen. So there are now ex uh, new, was it last year or the, the year before, new export controls that have been brought in, um, which include not just physical exports, but sort of intellectual property and things like that, which have actually made it a bit more difficult for companies to, to invest in China. So I think we're probably, I think there's a bit of lag, right? I think there's a bit of lag, but I think it's for, com we'll have to wait to see what happens in terms of politics here. Uh, and also, well, I think there will clearly be a stronger investment screening of Chinese investment into the UK coming up soon whether that will then affect the decisions about wood investors and things. I'm not sure. So people are taking much more notice of it in ways that they wouldn't have before. But I, I would say partly it will be to do with what happens in your presidential election uh, as much as what happens in the, um, I won't call it election, the uh, the general secretary appointment in China in, in October. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, thank you. This has been a really terrific talk and it's given me so much to think about. And uh, so I have lots of questions for you. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, so the first is related to this discourse about the China thread. Mm. And I mean, so this, I think, is a really it's a really interesting question. And like um, and one of you know, one of the things that we see in the US a lot is, you know, a lot of the discourse about the China thread takes over any kind of specific discussions about actual, you know, kind of narrowly defined what is it? train concerns or, you know, like actual, you know, real intellectual property considerations because, but, you know, the, the broad, as you, as you, you know, eloquently pointed out, this broad orange threat, you know, helps, you know, prevents us from thinking about like much more narrow questions. 
And that's actually something that I think is really interesting in these two examples that you bring up where, you know, one is a, one is a kind of much more pro-business uh, view. The other is a, you know, kind of very like broad spectrum China threat question. And in between this, I think um, one thing that, that really strikes me are these nebulous, kind of nebulous legal frameworks that are coming out of China, um, like the Hong Kong national security law, yeah, exactly. data security yeah, yeah. law. There are these kind of extraterritorial. That, the, 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 the Hong Kong law had to make, make people, the national security law had a big, big shock on people, I have to say. Which, Sorry, I yeah, no, 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 but I mean, no, but, um, but which kind of brings to light a lot of, you know, kind of enlivens a lot of these more nebulous concerns about about China's um about China's intentions by by actually listing them out and saying you know, here are these here's this extraterritorial oversight that we are asserting with all kind of very detailed um restrictions or you know kind of clear constraints about what we're what we're actually looking at it's just like national security broadly defined um, and we're not going to dig down into it so I guess I, what I was wondering is how when you're thinking about the China threat and and these kind of broad Chinese laws, how do you how do you navigate that um, in a kind of nuanced way rather than you know going in one direction or the other? So that's question number one. And question number two is also is um have you looked at so I, I was in Japan over the summer looking at a lot of these questions of Sino-US relations there. And one of the things that was really interesting um was that there are a lot of similar patterns that we that emerge from the Japanese context with like an increase in investment but also this concern you know negative popular opinion but you know a lot of Chinese investment and investment both ways mm. and also this concern about being caught between the U.S. and China mm. um so I see a lot of parallels and I was wondering if you've been looking comparatively at different countries that are caught in a similar way and what you found? I mean, the answer is quite simply no. I mean, this is new, yeah, new direction for me. Yeah. I've never really studied the UK dimension of this before. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have done it really if I'd not been for the pandemic in it as well. Okay. <laughs> but partly also because of this, I've been shocked by the speed of things and the various things I've been in. I guess the comparison that I have been looking at and would dearly love to do would be um, across Europe because that's e yeah. easy, easier for us to do. And I have sort of sketched out a research funding application on how, where, when, why do dominant discourses on the consequences of China's rise change and how does it affect policy? Mm. Um, but we are no longer eligible for EU funding. Uh -huh. um, we thought we were going to be, um, but we, uh, we found out earlier this year that uh, we've been kicked out now because the British government is prevaricating over the uh, border. So no, the, answer, the answer is no, but I do think there's a lot to be said in terms of a comparative um, study of this source. I mean, because the difference between Japan and one of the key differences with Europe as well and, and America uh, uh, is that when you talk about China as a security, the chances of Europeans dying in some sort of military conflict with, with China are very, very low, right? But you couldn't necessarily say the same thing about Japan. Right, yeah. Or even in the United States, you know, you are a security actor in the region in terms of big boats and guns and bombs and bullets in the way that we're not. As much as there's a, we're going to send some aircraft carriers that don't have planes and a commitment to uh, open, free and open sea lanes, uh, it's, it's a different dynamic. And in some respects, that created the freedom to pursue commercial relationships in the past. I didn't know. And the first question was on the how, how do you? Oh, extraterritorial. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, it's it's a really it's a really good question. It just created a lot of uncertainty. And in fact, the rest of the two Michaels, the Canadians, did as well. I mean, it made this sort of, uh, if if you like, a hypothetical sort of threat very real. Uh, and also, as well, uh, not so much talked about an Irish businessman who wasn't exactly arrested, uh, but wasn't allowed to leave China for, uh, for about three years because of uh, something to do with them. Um, aero industry and the Irish are getting involved. And I think the, the, the thing about the national security law is when you when you go to China, you, you sort of more or less know where the parameters and the boundaries of the permissible are going, right? It might, it might be various things that move around and things might get worse or better, but you, you sort of more or less know how to navigate it and where to go and where not to go and things to sort of avoid. You know, you, you build operate, uh, ways of operating within the, the system. That's got harder in the last 
few years as academic freedom. And I think this is the real problem in, with Hong Kong is nobody knows where these boundaries are going to fall, right? Where they're going to end up. Where what is the the, the parameters of the permissible? Where's it where's it going to lie? And it could you know, and things are volatile, and that just does create this uncertainty. So it's very difficult to be precise. It's really difficult to be precise, and that helps explain, I think, some of the some of the imprecision because we sort of just don't know and it's sort of yet another signal that whatever the future is going to look like it's probably not something that is is very nice so i do think and, and let me be clear when people talk about securitization of china often i think one of the implicit things they're saying is the erroneous or the mistaken securitization of China. i'm not saying there's nothing that needs to be, that there isn't a threat i'm saying we need to be trying to be a little bit more specific about the different types of things but it's not it's not always clear there are some things that we need to, to think about some things that uh, are probably much less of a problem and as i said before some problems that might take you in contradictory sort of uh, positions um but there's one thing you know that i even if all the evidence is to the contrary i just thoroughly believe in more but i still believe in engagement and trying to understand and trying to discuss and trying to have those conversations and and multiple ways of sort of interactions it, it strikes me that can't really be a bad thing but if you're actually one of the two michaels maybe you you, know, you might really seriously disagree but i you know let, and this is what we're, we're missing you know this three years has been horrible for so many many reasons you know and of course many people have had personal disasters but in terms of sort of breaking or at least obstructing these channels of communication that we had and for so hard won in many cases um i, th I think it's yeah, gonna take a long time to get them back as well other question Where are going? oh you have the last word <laughs> <laughs> oh well then let me end with a, a question on the future because right. i think I, I couldn't agree with you more on engagement and the problems that that COVID and perhaps a personal level engagement, sort of existential engagement, mm -hmm. as well as as under you know mutual understanding at some nation to nation level. But if you consider, right, we we've been talking about the problems uh, that, uh, of China's rise and the anxieties it causes, but consider. The alternatives uh, is alternative one that uh, we we Europe the West stop China's rise. You know how possible is that? Most of China's rise is is bound up with the Asia Pacific okay. rather than with either the United States or Europe as a particular place. It's not one line that they're you not know, one rope that they're pulling and coming up with that we could cut at the top. And the second thing is, well, you know, we can't stop China's rise. What about decoupling, you know, and get security that way? Well, if you look at the relative cost of decoupling to China and to the, I, I think about it in terms of U.S. but yeah, U.S. Europe, uh, the cost for China for decoupling will be considerably less in terms of its development prospects uh, than the cost to developed countries decoupling, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and I mean, the cost to both is considerable, mm. but how that balances out, and unless China responds with a similarly uh, self-destructive policy, the chances are self-isolation of developing developed countries rather than the isolation of China. Yeah, I haven't got it actually on this slide. I did have it on and took it off in one of the, one of the things that I was doing, but Dominic Raab was the former uh, foreign minister. Uh, the UK, not in the new government, um, and has been fairly critical of China himself in the past. And after the during the pandemic, said we can't go back to business as usual, have to have a deep dive. But in these various parliamentary committees that I was talking about, he was called to give evidence. And uh, I've got a lovely quote from him a slide where he's being pushed by uh, people, and he says, "Look, instinctively attractive as your hawkish position is." Where does it take us? What do you want to do? If anybody's got a, a better idea of how to deal with this relation, please come forward and tell me because I can't actually see what it is at the moment. And I think in some respects, the, the, 
there's almost an attempt to sort of go back to the cakeism to have the discourse disconnected from the actual you know, economic relationships. But the problem, of course, is that people respond to discourses and fear of a future, fear of a China led future might generate sort of UK responses to China. But in China, fear of uh, uh, an increasingly hostile Europe uh, and the investment treaty that came into being, well, never, you know, agreed but then never signed, you know, you might start thinking of other places too. Uh, and so I think. Or just China. Europe, well, Europe. People, I, mean, it, I mean, where do you go? If I'm right, right? And I hate to say this, but I'm not always. Um, <laughs> I, th I thought that there was no way that Xi Jinping could become the old dominant leader that has become wrong on that one. But if I'm right, and this is is really sort of what's at the heart, you know, sort of A and E, well, where does that leave you? I mean, does do you just cut off all relations? Or might even actually make the, the future of even work? I mean, I just don't know actually specifically uh, and can you have this cake is policy can you really have right we're now going to say uh xinjiang you're a, uh, you're a threat to national security but we'd like your investment but we don't want it in that power station but we will have it in that that, mm -hmm. that railway and can you 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 pick and choose like that i think the answer is no there's still not being a final decision over a third of the nuclear power stations that China's involved in or wants to be involved in. When there is, I suspect that it will be no thanks. If they say no thanks there, then I think Chinese involvement in Sizewell, which is the second one, will probably disappear. They'll probably pick up their tools and go home. And I'm not saying that they they should say yes, but I'm saying that there are, you know, consequences of this too. And yeah, that's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.